This is a 1976 Volkswagen Transporter T2, or the bay window as they're known. Along with its predecessor, these are the archetypal camper vans. And today I'm going to talk about the history, development and engineering of these vans, and then show you around one of the most recognisable vehicles in the world. The bay window was the second generation of the Volkswagen Type 2, or Transporter, replacing the old split-screen T1 in 1967. The order of the day was modernisation, and it follows exactly the same formula that made the older vans so successful. So we have an air-cooled flat 4 engine in the back, lots of passenger room on top, and the driver's legs dangling over the front axle. But it is quite different under the skin. It's about the same size as the old van, just a little bit longer and they gained a new electrical system and some new suspension to make it a bit nicer to drive. The split screen vans were in production for 17 years between 1950 and 1967, so Volkswagen knew what they had to do in order to keep production ticking over. Development started on a new van in 1960 and really started to progress after 1963. Starting with the engine, all T2s got a displacement upgrade from the old van, with 1.6 litre units initially, but later examples were available with 1.8 litre and 2 litre engines from the Type 4 Volkswagen. The sound of these engines is so distinctive, it can only be an air-cooled Volkswagen. The engine's strapped to a 4-speed manual gearbox, but in order to keep those wheels on the road, you need suspension. And here is one of the biggest differences with the bay window vans because at the back we have independent suspension with coil springs and shock absorbers, and importantly, CV joints transferring the power to the wheels. It's absolutely nothing fancy, but it's a whole lot better than the swing axle setup in the older vans, which allowed for mad camber changes depending on the road surface. The front end has moved on as well, with ball joints replacing the kingpins of old. These suspension changes make the T2 an awful lot more refined and compliant on the road. Another big change to the T2 is the electrical system. These bay windows have a 12 volt system, which again is nothing remarkable, it's the standard, but it modernised it and made the electronics much more reliable, as 6 volt systems can get very weak over time as the earths deteriorate. Changes like this and the suspension aren't things that you can see on the surface, but they make a massive difference to the usability of these vans, especially in the modern world. An awful lot more was expected from the bay window than was expected from the old split screen back in 1950. One of the biggest new expectations was safety, especially in the United States. As production progressed, they got deformable structures in the front end, larger rear lights and a collapsible steering column although this is all relative due to the clear and obvious massive safety innovations of late. But for their era, these weren't bad at all. Now let's take a look at the exterior, and the construction of the T2's body is quite different to the T1, with a double skin increasing strength to allow bigger windows on these second generation transporters. Therefore we have a slightly cleaner look to the whole van. The front end is cleaner too, with no big V-shape down the front anymore, which I think is a shame, but the T2s do look more modern. It's still got character to the design, not only because of the two-tone, but because of the placement of the circular headlamps and the lines of the front end. At the top there's this fresh air vent for fresh air into the cabin, with indicators at the end. Earlier T2s had their indicators next to the bumper at the bottom. It won't have escaped your attention that this example has a spare wheel on the front, which does obscure some of the lines I was talking about, and the big VW badge on the front as well. The windscreen, now one piece, wraps around the sides giving better visibility, and of course the nickname Bay Window. At the back we have these new crescent shaped air intakes, which force more air into the engine compartment than on the old split screens. As they're air cooled, it's so important that enough air gets in for cooling. The rear lamps are small but relatively tall, and the tailgate has a high lip, but of course this is because the bottom section opens up to reveal the engine. The style of the van is very Germanic in that it doesn't necessarily try very hard, and it's understated while still being characterful. That's something that's very, very hard to achieve. And now we're sat inside, and the first thing you can tell is that the Driving position is characterful, that's the word I'm going to use, characterful, because you obviously have this 
you know, bus driver driving position, which is mandated by the engineering because the steering column goes straight down into the floor and then goes into the steering box and back to the front axle, which is right below where I'm sitting now. Um, so the steering column has to be like that. And it's perfectly normal for a car like this to have a steering wheel angle like that anyway. As I said, in front of you, you are greeted with this enormous two spoke steering wheel, very, very thin rimmed as you'd expect from a car of the era. Um, of course, no power steering, so this is meant to give you more leverage to make it easier to steer. In the centre we have a horn, I'm not going to press that because it's quite early in the morning and that wouldn't be fair. Um, these little slender column stalks, which don't do very much, you have of course your indicators and your flash, which has the loudest relay in the world. Um, <laughs> but there you go, on the other side we have your wiper says first speed, second speed. And it says wash there, so I'd expect that to be a wash. But there is a little momentary switch here marked washers. So, I don't know, make of that what you will. Um, on the steering column itself, you have tyre pressures there in German as well. And, of course, your ignition barrel. There's no steering lock that I can see. But then again, we are 1976, so we're still in a time where a lot of cars didn't have a steering lock. There are not very many switches across this dashboard, just lights here which is your classic Volkswagen pull switch for your side lights and your dipped beam and then on the left hand side we have a pull for your hazard lights which makes a lovely analog click from a relay which is somewhere under there instrumentation is really basic you just have these three binnacles and this one on the right is a blanking plate there's nothing in there and the one on the left only has a fuel gauge and then warning lights down here for ignition, uh, your indicators, uh, main beam and your flash, and your oil pressure. Of course, there's no temperature gauge because these are air-cooled vans and that wouldn't make any sense, unless you had oil temperature, actually. Anyway, gloss over that. Um, in the centre, you have a speedometer which goes up to 90 miles an hour. Can you imagine doing 90 miles per hour in one of these vans? And one of the most funny things about this is that when you turn your lights on, you do get gauge illumination, but... That's it, you, you can see it best in the fuel gauge. That's your illumination. Great. To the left of the binnacle, you have your temperature control and direction. This is direction and that's temperature, I believe. And they come out through little vents at the end of the dashboard here. And again, ones for the screen up there. Um, the heat obviously needs to travel from the back of the van. Um, I'm pointing there, but you can't see. Um, needs to come from the back of the van. Of course, it's air cooled, so it goes from the exhaust manifold and then comes through the centre of the van and up through this pipe here which means that by the time it gets to the front um, the air is not warm anyway um, and what air that is coming out is feeble at best I think that switch there is for your heater fan um, this one has a single din head unit fitted obviously it wouldn't have had even this size I think from the factory but it's got a CD player Below that there was an ashtray in there, but cup holders are more useful in the 21st century. Then to the left of that there is a cigarette lighter hole, 12 volt socket. Um, and continuing along there is a handle here, I presume for getting into the van. Um, and then the glove box cover. And you see this plaque on the glove box cover says Devon Conversions. Devon Conversions were a company that of course converted VW buses into camper vans. None of these came as camper vans from the factory. Um, Devon conversions I don't think exist anymore um, and it's all been ripped out and renewed with homemade stuff so it's no longer a Devon but it still retains its plaque there and then we have in a glove box which flips open and stays open as well we have lots of gubbins and in the centre of course you have a completely flat floor again you really can't see much of that but you have a very very flat floor which which means it is very practical, but of course the driving position is very weird. You have the pedals mounted on the floor, there's your clutch pedal, and then you have the steering column in the middle, and your brake and your throttle pedal. All floor mounted, of course, it's been a Volkswagen. And in the centre you have your gear lever, which is vague, but that's what you expect. These vans don't actually have Beetle gearboxes, they have a gearbox only for the van, which is a little bit stronger than the Beetle gearbox, just because of the size and weight of these things. The handbrake is here and it's a pulley thing that acts on this lever on the floor. 
which goes to the back of the van. That's an ingenious little bit of engineering that I like to see. That would be covered up on a modern car, but I like seeing that. At the front you have, if I point with my foot, you have these vents here, which again, these kind of things allow um, heat, into, allow fresh air, sorry, into the van. Um, which means that you can't really get very stuffy in these vans. Uh, there is a lot of airflow, even if the air isn't exactly hot. And although the dashboard is very, very short, you sit very, very far back from the windscreen, mainly because, you know, the, the steering wheel is so far away from the dashboard and the steering wheel itself is so big. The pedals are very, very far back as well. It is very different to a normal car, but then that, that's what you'd expect from a van like this. And you have quarter lights, which don't open, unfortunately, but the only real downside of having quarter lights, apart from the fact that these don't open, is that the side mirrors are really, really far back. So when you're driving along and you want to look in your mirror, you've got to look all the way around there to look in your mirror. One thing that really surprises you when you get in one of these vans is the space efficiency, because of course, they're quite small compared to a modern van, but the amount of room inside is really, really good. I mean, you do lose things in safety there, but the packaging is really, really nice. Of course, you don't have enough room to stand up, but this roof on this one does pop up a bit. Um, I'm sitting on this, oh, camera work, peak camera work. I'm sitting on this very 90s pattern seat here at the back, uh, but you do get well, you do get, this one's completely custom, so you don't get anything, but um, this one, you get all your cupboards with bits and bobs in them. Uh, there is a sink, there is a little fridge, there's a leisure battery as well, so of course it all runs properly. Um, and even back here in the, in the load area, there's a lot of room there and more storage up here, etc. You have curtains that match the exterior. That's lovely. Um, and I'm told it is for birth, so surprisingly practical again. I mean, there is a lot more room than I expect in here, and there is no reason why you couldn't live with one of these in the, in, in the modern world. I know a lot of people do. A lot of people use these as proper camper vans, but not only just for the whole experience of it being a Volkswagen camper van, but they still are remarkably practical, even if the engineering isn't up to modern standards. The success of the bay window is hard to understate, with a million units being built between 1968 and 1971, and a peak production of nearly 295,000 in 1972. From 73, production started to fall away with the oil crisis, and the German economy going into recession as well as exchange rates. In Europe and North America, the bay window ran until 1979, but in Brazil they were still making these things until 2013, so they had an extraordinarily long life, 46 years to be precise, although by the end they had water-cooled inline four engines. I love these things, and I suppose you probably do too. They're in that very select group of cars that just makes everybody smile. One of these makes you think of that idyllic lifestyle you always dreamt of. My favourite cars are the ones that make me smile, not necessarily the ones that I think are cool or the ones that excel in terms of engineering or design. And this car definitely makes me smile. Thank you for watching. Please click like and subscribe if you enjoy my videos and I'll have more again coming along next week.